I'm talking to you from COP28 in Dubai. Today is the sixth day of this conference. So in some senses, we are midway. But let me give you a sense of what I see as some of the takeaways from week one and our expectations of what should happen, must happen at COP. On day one, the COP agreed to sign the loss and damage uh, agreement. They also agreed to put in money into it. I know it's not enough. There are many issues, many obstacles, many challenges, including who will put in how much money, including whether the money is going to go for what kind of loss, damage and to whom. But for a moment, I think it's important for us to recognize the fact that countries did come together. That an agreement as historic as loss and damage, which is being discussed for the last 30 years, did come and did happen. The second issue is very clear that this COP has changed the discussions on finance. Now, I say this with some words of caution, but we have seen a change in the narrative on finance. We at CSE have been pointing out that climate finance and the $100 billion, uh, which was promised in 2015, is not even the beginning of the conversation. We need to talk about it in terms of the quality of finance. We need to understand that the bulk of climate finance is coming as loans and it's going to countries who are already indebted and the same countries who are battered by extreme weather events. We also know that climate finance is not going to these countries uh, for renewable energy, for new sources, because the cost of capital is high. Now, these conversations are happening at this COP. And I hope that this discussion will now be taken forward so that we can come to a much better conclusion in terms of how we want to move ahead. The third point, and this is controversial, let me make it clear, is I am glad that the issue of fossil fuel is out in the open. Now, IPCC says that unabated coal must be phased out by 2050. But it says that oil and gas can continue at 60% reduction in terms of oil, 45% reduction in terms of gas by 2050. The question for fossil fuels then is, who has the right to use them? And I say this at a time when, please understand that a country like the United States, which has completely overused its share of the carbon budget, is today the world's largest exporter of LNG. It is the largest producer in history of oil and gas, oil in particular. So let's not have such trite, meaningless discussions on fossil fuel. We need the issue of fossil fuel on the table because the developed countries are not phasing out. And countries like mine need space to grow. Now that then leads me to what are my expectations from week two? What do we want this COP to achieve? My biggest expectation is that the GST, the global stock take, will be both ambitious but also equitable. So GST, if it undermines the principles of equity, can never be ambitious. And this is something that we hope in week two, when GST negotiations conclude, they will be based on the principle of moving ahead in a way that we can build a cooperative world order so that the developed countries, the industrialized world, which has already overused its share of the carbon budget, reduce, and the developing and the emerging world has the right to grow. And that's going to be a make or break, in my view, for the GST. 
Let's be very, very clear. 70% of the world today does not have the right to development, right to energy. That world will need development. But if development comes without the abatement technologies, without the reduced use of coal, without electricity for all, then you will make sure that we have an insecure world, a world in which climate change action will never be at the scale and pace that we need it. So this is my biggest expectation from COP28. And I hope that governments, as they come together, will go beyond their selfish nationalist interests and will think about this existential threat that needs the world not to be divided, but to come together and act as one for our common future.